Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is the 20th of September of 2020. And this podcast is going to be discussing why you should pursue critical care medicine, whether it be as a physician, as an NP, as a PA, as a critical care nurse, why you should pursue critical care medicine. And I love, love, love this topic. I'm super excited to go ahead and share my perspectives with you all on this topic. Several podcasts ago or several posts ago, whatever, depending on where you're checking out this content, I made a couple posts about why you should not pursue critical care medicine. And it was quite humorous, the backlash I got from that. But I guess people didn't want to hear what the honest truths were about critical care medicine. Because again, not everything is sunshine and roses. And part of the reason why I decided to go ahead and do that part first before talking about the good things of critical care is because there's a lot of confirmation bias when it comes to listening to good things. You know, you want to hear the good things. It makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside. But in reality, you have to know that, again, it's not all sunshine and roses, and you need to know what the bad things are. In reality, it wasn't supposed to be a deterrent to tell people not to do critical care, but rather to be completely transparent or as as transparent as I could be given my knowledge base as to what you could realistically expect out of the career. Now, I will say that I'm giving the perspective of a critical care physician, but for those of you who do not know me well, I also have a lot of experience by proxy, being that my wife is a critical care nurse. She's a CCRN with many years of experience, and I have to hear about her experiences a lot, her her interactions with other physicians, other nurses, etc. So that has afforded me some perspectives, which I will try to attempt to respectfully comment on, so don't get upset because I misspeak about something or I get something wrong. I'm just trying to do my best to convey this information to you. Ultimately, though, I cannot speak for nurses and other ICU personnel who contribute to the ICU team. I know it's kind of common knowledge to say this, but it's it's important to say that whenever somebody comes to the ICU, whether they're a patient or a family, it is the worst day of their life. Everybody says this, but it's actually true. And so therefore, you have the direct privilege to work hard to make it better for them. I feel the need to go ahead and reemphasize that because there are a lot of people who get into medicine for the wrong reasons, whether it be critical care nursing or critical care medicine or medicine in general. They forget that the whole purpose of it is to try to make people better, not to go ahead and fill your pockets because ultimately you are well compensated for what you do. I mean, there are a lot of nuance and whatnot to it, but you're well compensated as a physician or a nurse compared to the median household income. That being said, you're being compensated because you have the privilege of trying to make people better and trying to save some lives. This is ultimately what we do. So just wanted to get that out of the way because a lot of people, when they have to take care of a patient, they just get upset or frustrated and, you know, they don't want to take an assignment. And that that to me is just wrong. It's not, it's not the right mentality to have when you go into medicine. Let's get into the meat and potatoes of this topic as to why you should pursue critical care medicine. And I'm going to start off with the perspective of physicians when it comes to fellowship training, because in my prior prior podcast, I discussed how there's an opportunity cost and how it extends time to your long journey of becoming a doctor to pursue additional training, additional training, excuse me, in critical care medicine, because ultimately it's a long, long journey, guys. But I must say this fellowship, at least in my opinion, is a lot of fun. I really, really enjoyed my time. As a matter of fact, just last week, I went on vacation with my co-fellow and we've seen each other every year that we've been out. It's been absolutely amazing. I really wish that you have the same type of camaraderie with the people in your fellowship program if you choose to go down this route. And if you choose to go down pure critical care medicine, such as I did after internal medicine, you know, those two years go by extremely quickly. Just two years. It goes by like a snapping your fingers. Where I trained, I was honestly treated more like faculty than, than I was a trainee. You also find yourself socializing with your attendings far more than you did during residency. At least we did this once a month get together where we socialized and had chicken wings or had dinner somewhere. It was, it was a lot of fun. And the lines blur a little bit as there's a lot of banter and whatnot between the attendings and the fellows. Ultimately, some of the attendings are looking at you like someone who they could work with and possibly hire when your training is done. So think about it like a long two-year interview as to whether they're going to offer you a position. Receiving training in critical care where you're able to pretty much take care of any critically ill patient who shows through the door, is it's an incredible feeling. I mean, it's very empowering to have the confidence and personal strength and watch that form over the two years where 
you know, you were once extremely green starting your fellowship. You didn't know what to start studying, where to, what to start reading, what, what in the world is a CBICU, like, like what happened to me. And then over those two years, you become extremely hardened. You become extremely competent. And just watching your own personal development as you go through these rotations makes the training so much more worthwhile. And then when you start your first job, it all just clicks and, and you feel amazing. I, I remember my first my first day working as a as an attending by myself, fresh out of fellowship. I I felt pretty darn good, you know, all things considered. I was competent in taking care of the patient population that I had presented to me. And that's because I was well trained. Those two years were extremely, extremely beneficial. Needless to say, I think you guys get the point. I loved fellowship. But I did mention in my podcast about the reasons why not to do critical care fellowships, the fact that there's a financial opportunity cost to this, that you'll miss out on potentially $400,000 of income during these two years. And again, I was using the rough math of a salary of two fifty dollars for hospital medicine and a salary of fifty grand a year for fellows for the PGY-4 and PGY-5 year. Obviously, this is not a accurate number. I know everything is different. Just just enjoy the podcast, guys. There's a rebuttal to this, obviously, about this opportunity cost of four hundred grand. Most problem, most programs, excuse me, allow you the opportunity to moonlight, which helps mitigate some of this income difference. For example, during my second year of fellowship, I moonlight I did moonlighting at a facility. Well, I did a couple of different jobs because obviously I'm a workaholic, but I did a moonlighting opportunity in a ICU in a town that was 45 minutes away from my from my facility. And then I also did some hospital locums jobs, some hospitalist locums jobs, excuse me, where I did an admitting service that was about eight hours every evening. Well, not every evening, but when I was available. And I also worked at an LTAC. And to be completely honest with you, I pretty much surpassed my fellowship salary by moonlighting. I mean, I worked my butt off, but you're in control of your own destiny. During fellowship, you do get time off for research, which you honestly could leverage as you please. You know, when you're on research, you can work on your research during the day. And then in the evenings, you could cover the admitting shift. You work eight hours for uh, X amount of money. And, you know, you make pretty good money when it's all said and done. Don't mind if I do. Not to mention that you'll ultimately earn a larger salary once you finish your training as an intensivist compared to a hospitalist. How much more, honestly, depends on your market and the number of variables, of course. Like if you want to go into private practice or academia, all that gives you different different numbers when it's all said and done as to how much money you can make. But over the course of your career, remember, this is a marathon, not a sprint. You'll make up that opportunity cost and you'll recoup that money over the course of your career. So for those people who want to become critical care nurse practitioners and critical care PAs, there are these new exciting training programs that exist, which could help hone the skills of these practitioners. I, I honestly didn't know that these existed until a couple of years ago when I started hearing them about them. I can't, I can't say I know too much about it, but when I did go ahead and Google the different programs, I see that they're showing up more and more every single year. But from my understanding, they pay you about 60 grand a year. And you go to some facility where they train you as if you're a critical care fellowship with, you know, point of care ultrasound procedures, uh, management of critically ill patients. And this is a great way to pad your CV to help you get a help you get a better job in critical care medicine. In addition to all this, you're also going to find some good emotional benefits of additional training. Like I said, you're going to find joy in your training. At least I did. You're going to develop lifelong friends and relationships, kind of like I mentioned before. And you'll remember that money isn't everything. Job and career satisfaction, to give you that purpose, is everything, at least in my opinion. You'll be part of a small, close-knit community of intensivists, and ultimately, we all take care of each other. Same thing applies for critical care nurses. I know that there's a lot of banter between you all. It's pretty funny how catty people get, but ultimately, you all defend each other to the death when somebody comes after you. Next up, let's talk about job security. As you all probably know, there's a massive intensivist shortage throughout the country. Same thing goes for critical care nurses, but I'll get more into that later. We need help, guys. People are living longer. They're dying in the ICU. They're not dying at home anymore. Everybody comes uh, 95-year-old, 195-year-old, excuse me, to not upset anybody. 195-year-old grandma, trach, pegged, etc. is not going to die at home. No, she's going to die in the ICU. You know that the hospice orders are going to be rescinded. But... 
were always going to be needed. COVID showed us that in many places that were hard hit, physicians and clinicians who were critically ill patient trained, who were ICU trained, were at a huge shortage. And who knows what this could have caused with regards to mortality. Do we have higher mortalities than COVID because of a shortage of intensivists? Who knows? I don't know that answer right now. There are internal medicine as well as family medicine trained hospital medicine physicians who are, who are taking care of ICU patients at smaller community hospitals. And they do a really good job much of the time to fill this large, large void. But I sympathize for these fine clinicians because they don't really have all the training and or resources at their facilities to be able to take care of these patients. And again, this is no fault of their own. They're doing a good job. They're doing the best they can, but they don't have that training. I I know that they could go ahead and get additional training, but it's, it's, it's not the same, guys. Uh, no offense to anybody. I often get phone calls from these shops seeking advice on how to take care of X, Y, or Z problem. Most of the time, I just gladly accept the patient transfer over to my facility when they're in over their heads. But the point of all this is that we need more intensivists out there. Then when it comes to critical care nurses, the ICU is a place that has a lot of turnover. Like I mentioned before, many, nurse, many ICU nurses go to NP or CRNA school. This means that there's a lot of turnovers, a lot of openings. Every, every facility that I've gone to, they say, oh yeah, nurse turnover is a problem. Well, the truth is that it's such a problem because the grass is always greener on the other side. Um, a lot of times the nurses aren't being well taken care of and it, it is what it is. I'm not going to go down that route. But also critical care nurses are the cream of the crop. They have a lot of opportunities to go to NP and CRNA school. And for those of you who are in nursing school right now or planning to be nurses, this is ultimately an opportunity for you. The pandemic was a great example of how the amount of skilled and trained nurses were in such shortage. And we need great nurses to be able to take care of our patients and our, and our, and our population. Well, it really seems as if I'm going to make this into a four-parter as opposed to a three-parter. But there are going to be many things coming up, including schedule logistics, the pros of working night shifts, night differential compensation, what, what I mean by actually doing the job of critical care, you know, the good things about the high-stress environment, as well as interdisciplinary and interpersonal practice. And I'm going to discuss plenty with regards to the big wins and the big saves. Stay tuned for all those podcasts coming up in the upcoming days. We'll see when I have a chance to go ahead and record them. I also have to finish writing out the writing out the whole entire blog post. But again, thank you for your support. If you're listening to this on YouTube, hit me a thumbs up and like the like the video. If you're listening to it on any other podcast, please go ahead and give it five stars, whatever rating you possibly think is warranted because it helps the podcast grow. Thanks a lot for your help, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.